Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad for the opportunity to witness the seventh day of the Marriage Summit in the year 2024. Are you excited? Let's give God praise. Let's go ahead and worship him. Let's thank him for the life that he has given us. Let's thank him for everything that he has blessed our lives with. The good marriage, the children that he has blessed us with. Let's give him praise. The Lord is good. He's the one that watch over us on a daily basis. The Bible says he does not sleep. He does not slumber. When we sleep as parents, God is still walking, watching on our children. God is watching them. As, as husbands, God is watching our wives. As wives, God is watching our husbands. So God is the one that preserves us when we are not even aware of it. Let's thank him for the things that he does that we know and the things that he does that we don't know. The Lord is good. His goodness is visible unto us. God is good unto us and his goodness has been good to us. Let's give him praise. Let's bless his name. The Lord is good. His mercies endures forevermore. He's the one that fights our battles for us, giving us victories on every side. He's the one that gives us access to the, to the blessings, to the provisions that are beyond our imaginations. Let's give him praise. The Lord is awesome. And the Lord is for us. The Lord is not against us. Let's thank him. Let's bless his name. Father, we bless your name. Together, we lift our voices unto you and we declare that you are God, you are good, and we are grateful. Let your name be praised in our midst. Bless us much more in this day in the name of Jesus. And let us be established in the truth. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to stand before us. I'm expectant in advance for that time that we will have the opportunity to witness my wife being a blessing to us. And I'm sure we are also expectant until then. Let us enjoy the grace of God that is available for us in this season. In this day, we are going to be looking at what is titled The Greatest Problem of Failed Marriages. The greatest problem of failed marriage is not divorce. Now, that is very alarming. Somebody can be saying, what are you saying? But you said, what are you saying? So let us look at it. The greatest problem of failed marriage is not divorce. Divorce is a problem of failed marriage, but it is not the greatest. There is something that is greater than it. Something we should dread. <laughs> That's the goal of this message. Showing us that, because if we just think when marriages fail, both men and women, the, both the male and female, they go apart. If we think that's all, that's not all. There's something that is worse than the man and his wife being apart. And that is what we will be studying in this message. In the last session, we looked at the book of Genesis chapter 5, and we saw something. The chapter concluded with the story of Noah who uh, was the uh, son of Lamech. Now, Noah, the Bible ended at chapter 5, verse 32 with, the Bible says, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Am, and Japheth. That's where the Bible stopped with. So, the Bible introduced us to the character called Noah. He's a, he's a very significant character in the message that we are, we are looking at. And the Bible says, that man, Noah, who was also a son, to a man called Lamech, had three sons, Shem, Am, and Japheth. And I'm sure you would soon realize that they are very fundamental, very foundational to our lives as a people of this generation. Now let's jump now to Genesis chapter 6, and I will read from verse 1. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, where men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Who were the daughters born to? The men. Men were multiplying on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. So these were called daughters of men. There's a place we are going. Verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. His flesh is earth. 
Do we remember where we started with when we're looking at the man of the head, the man of the spirit, and the man of God? Do we understand that? Now, look at it. The Bible says, He is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the head in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in, when they became one, when they came in to the daughters of men, the Bible says, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Nothing seems bad yet, right? Nothing seems to be worse than divorce yet, right? But let's continue. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 5. Then the Lord God, sorry, then the Lord saw that the wickedness, the wickedness of man was great in the head. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the head and that every intent, every intention, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only, only having no other space for something else. Only evil continually. Day one, day two, today forever. Evil. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the head and he was grieved in his heart. May our lives, may our generation never grieve the heart of God in the name of Jesus. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with what Jesus what the Bible was declaring to us concerning the Holy Spirit. That do not grieve the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So God actually doesn't love to be grieved. <laughs> if the Spirit of God must not be grieved, because when a man grieves the Holy Spirit, it, the man has committed the greatest sin of all. It is without forgiveness. So imagine the, the old human race, the old mankind grieving God. So the mankind had entered that zone of unforgivable sin. Bible says the heart of God was grieved. So verse 7, so the Lord said, I will. That's it. When you commit an unforgivable sin, I'm almost moved in my heart to realize that when we think God hates divorce, you know, when somebody uses a strong word, I hate. You know, it's a very strong word. If you think God hates divorce, I want to challenge us with this statement that there is something that God hates much more than divorce. And it is what comes out of faith marriages. Now, God hates the faith marriage, the divorce. But there's something that God hates much more. The product of a faith marriage. But we are, we are not there yet. So the Bible says, the Lord said, I will destroy. I will destroy. I will destroy. Many people have entered that zone now. Where God has determined in his heart, except he shows mercy, he has determined to destroy. Because the things they think about, the things they produce on a daily basis, I've seen, I've seen and I've heard, I've watched in movies, especially local movies in Nigeria, where you will see women who have been abandoned by their husbands, who are left to take care of all the children that the husbands became one with them to produce. And then out of frustration, they wake up in the morning, they have to face six children, five children, feed them, send them to school. And the frustration comes to the point where a woman wakes up in the morning and the only thing he wants to wake up, wake the children up is by saying, wake up, you useless children. Wake up, you good for nothing children. Wake up, you children who will never become something great. So we have a generation where certain people have been destined for destruction by the virtue of the marriages that have failed. Now, we'll soon get to all those issues, but let's see this. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creeping thing and beast of the air, for I am sorry <laughs> that I have made them. I'm sorry. But the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was it an accidental matter? <laughs> Now, if you look at the story of Cain that we read earlier in the last couple of sessions, we saw how Cain emerged 
We also saw that apart from Cain, Cain also, the parent of Cain got another child called Seth. And from Seth, the Bible says, a new generation emerged different from the generation of Cain. And from the Seth, we could see a man called Enoch. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Genesis chapter 5 verse 22. Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. What do you think happens to the children <laughs> of a man that walked with God for over 300 years? So you can see that things don't just happen suddenly. When Cain was going, or let me say, when Cain was getting older, he gathered his, his wives together and said, Oh, a man wounded me. I killed him. In fact, somebody... Let me look at it. A young man hurt me a little or hurt me somehow. I killed him too. I kill. I kill at will. What do you think will be the norm, the culture of the kingdom where the father says to the, to the wife, I kill? So you can understand that when the father has this attitude of killing, which he also got from his own grand, great-grandfather, you can understand that the generation will be a killing generation, a murderous generation. But the Lord introduced us to another generation that began with Seth, which also had Enoch inside it. Enoch walked with God. And from Enoch, a generation began that knew God, that related with God, and that taught the children the ways of God. Noah was a product of that training, that, that build up that God was in, that God was involved. Noah was a product of it. So Noah was not a product of a failed marriage. Now, the other people of the Cain lineage were also were of the products, were of the line that destroys, that maims, that kills, that destroys, that corrupts, that are evil. But Noah came to the other side. So that when you start reading, but Noah found favor in the sight of God, you don't look at God as if God is partial or was partial. Now, the Bible says God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, the same the man will reap. So look at the seeds called Cain and the seed called Seth. Now because of the way they evolved over time, over the years, generations to generations, a time came that the seed of Seth found favor in the sight of God. So, it is also because the fathers knew God, the fathers sought God, the fathers taught the children the ways of God, and so they were able, they were able, they had the capacity. You remember, you can't give what you don't have. Because they had relationship with God, they could hand over the same relationship with God to their children. No wonder when Noah emerged, the Bible says Noah found favor. And so it's possible for a child that is born in a Christian home to become bad. But it's difficult for a child that is not born into a Christian home to become good. So you can have cases of children that were born and brought up in the way of God and then they end up becoming bad. It's possible. It's, it's not something that is expected, but it's possible. But it becomes a miracle to see a child that has been born into a dysfunctional home who comes to know God on his own or, or, on, a, or on, on her own. So do we understand? So you don't just tell yourself as a parent, I can live my life anyhow. I get a good job. I'm so busy at work. I get home by 11 p.m. My children are asleep. I see make sure I provide for them and I pay their school fees. That's all. You see, in the long run, the generations, in the long run, the generations that will come from you, that will come through your children, we never know God and we never do good. The opposite of good is evil. Guess what? Nobody loves evil. Even the evil people don't love evil. <laughs> I watch movies a lot. And I've come to realize watching movies, whether it's an American movie or Chinese or Korean movie or Nigerian movie, I've never found any mafia group, any gang, any occultic group or occultic person or persons that kills people. I've never found anyone that was happy when their own children were killed or their family was injured or attacked. So no matter how people are evil, no matter how evil people can be, they don't want evil. I've also found that, that proud people don't love pride. 
proud people don't want people to be proud to them. You see a proud man saying, me? Talking to me like that? A whole me? So they don't like it. So those who are evil don't like evil. How much more those of us who are good? We must detest evil with all our being, all our fiber. We must detest evil. And this is how to avoid it. Don't just talk you hate evil, you don't want evil. Make sure your children are good children. And you can only do that by being a good father and being a good mother and teaching them the good principles for life. Guess what? If you don't teach them the good principles, they will pick it up from the generation of Cain that is in their street that goes to school today with them. Guess what? You are not the only generation. You could be a set generation that we ultimately find favor. What happens when you abandon to train your children and then they go to schools, they meet Cain's children. They meet the children of Lamech. <laughs> that Lamech that called his wives and said, see, I kill you. The children of Lamech will kill. The children of Lamech will lie. The children of Lamech will commit all manner of atrocities. Why? They got it from their father, Lamech. And Lamech ultimately got it from all his fathers up to Cain. Do we understand? You have to take responsibility for the man. and the, the, You have to take responsibility for the men and women that our children become. Don't allow your child to become a man without you being deliberate about it. Let me not jump ahead. Let's continue the verses. So, Bible says, not found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. Let's just read verse 9 to verse 12 and then we, we stop it there. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. <laughs> this is not like a ripe purple that falls down. He walked for it. His great-grandfather walked with God. And his father, I'm sure, also walked with God. Do we understand? So, you don't also expect that you who don't walk with God, we have children that walk with God. The Bible says he was perfect. The Bible says Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons. I expect there to be children that also walk with God. Shem, Am, and Japheth. And from the benefit of hindsight, those of us who have read the story very well, you will notice that of all the three children, two of them were great people. They really knew God. They had the fear of God. One of them also became almost like his uncles. <laughs> he became almost like his uncles. He saw the nakedness of the father and instead of covering it in privacy and secrecy, he made it a public matter. So a wrong attitude to the point that the father got angry when he got to know about it. And the father didn't bless him. You know, we're dealing with getting blessed in marriage. You get married, you get blessed by God. In marriage, you've been blessed. And that is why it is in marriage and in family that we talk about blessing. Really, blessing is a family matter. You don't, you don't bless an outsider through blessing it in-house. That's why when a believer who is not really, oh, sorry, let me not say a believer. A believer is a believer. When a man who calls himself a Christian is not really a believer, so he's not really a member of the family of God, and he goes about saying, God bless you, bless you, bless you. You see, blessing doesn't fall on outsiders. Jesus said, you, you are not a member of the family. You want to eat on the table? And the woman said, even somebody like that can eat the crumbs that falls from the table. Even dogs can eat it. So you understand that there are things that are meant for people who are of the house. And so, look at it. Apart from that child of Noah that didn't know the fear of God, they too feared God. And I believe now there are generations that belong to those who feared God. The generation of Shem. The generation of Japheth. And I'm sure there is also a generation that belongs to Ham. People on the earth that follow the pattern of Ham. Don't forget, when God destroyed the entire earth, God began everything else with these three boys. Do we see it? So we can see that even now when we look at ourselves, even though we can now see that, oh, the children of Cain, they were destroyed. With the, the, Bible did it, the Bible didn't mention them being saved. They were destroyed. 
So you always ask yourself, how come there is still things that are not correct in our generation? Some people still came from arm. <laughs> and as arm began to emerge, evolve, don't forget, the children of Shem and the children of Japheth would also send their children to school. And if they too also drop the ball at any point in time, their children, some of them will pick lessons from some of the children of Ham and some of the grandchildren of Ham. That is how the cultures of Ham get to permeate the families of, of, Sham, uh, of Shem and Japheth over time. And so, knowing fully well that we are facing cultural battle or cultural battle in the world. The culture of good versus the culture of evil. It is therefore important for parents to confront these battles by being deliberate with their parenting. Knowing that while you try to train your children the good, the internet, the TV series, the cartoon networks, and the things they they are taught in classes, the things their friends tell them in school, their friends that have different belief system, different faith system, different lifestyle, the things they teach them in school put every pressure on the things we teach them. Now, if this can help somebody, so let me just let it out. It's like my own private secret, one of them. I have many. You know, I've said in one of those sessions that marriage is a secret matter. It's not supposed to be open. Don't make your marriage a public affair. So if I just let out this secret. Now, when I got married with, to my wife, I made a decision. I said, I will make sure that nobody, whether man or woman, will speak more than me to my wife. So that's why from that time, I've become like a parrot, especially with my wife. I can't keep quiet all day. And I do that, saving my energy. When my wife comes, Talk has come. We will gist. And I have to make sure that I gist to a point that I will overwhelm whatever anybody has said to her with what I'm saying to her. Now, if marriages can understand this beyond marriage, taking it to our children, teachers have spoken to our children, their friends have spoken to them, do we give enough time? And this is not to make us think that I've been doing very well in this. I need to do, especially with children, I'm trying with my wife, <laughs> but with the children, I need to still make sure I do it, that it doesn't matter how many hours they've spent in school, they can spend also enough time with me and my wife to the point that beyond the attitude of the teacher, they share our attitude, they share our spirit, they share our body, not the teacher's attitude, not a friend's attitude. So you can find a child, a woman, a girl, a girl of yours, maybe 10 years, 12 years, and her friends have told her, you are too slim, or you are too fat, you are too short, and you are too tall. And then she develops attitude, she develops self-esteem problem. And the reason is because you have not been telling her how beautiful she is. So at what point will fathers be telling their daughters, do you know you are, you are just so pretty? The daughter knows her mom is pretty and you love the mom. So when you tell her that she's pretty also, she's beautiful, she will believe you. But we don't say it. Somebody will say, I don't want it to enter her head. Guess what? People are telling her. Our job is to tell more than what people are telling. Tell more than what people are telling. It's very important. Don't wonder how evil gets to penetrate everywhere. Evil comes through communication. That's why the Bible says evil communication. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Evil communication so there can be good communication. And that's what you as a father, you as a mother must do with your children. You know, we're looking at what is the greatest problem of failed marriage. Because we have realized it is not just divorce. <laughs> But when there is divorce, marriages are fed. We are like divorced, fed marriage, divorce. They are equal. <laughs> so beyond the divorce, what else is bad? And is, it is possible for a marriage not to even fail in the sense of just leading to divorce. They fail in taking responsibility for these matters that we are looking at. Look at it. But we say the earth also, the earth also was corrupt before God. <laughs> and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and this is where I want us to note. 
God looked upon the head. And indeed, God is the one saying this. And indeed, it was corrupt. I imagine God looking at what he has done and he said, oh, indeed, it is good. So when God says, it is not good for a man to be alone, I believed him because he knows everything. And I, I, I believed him not just because I think it's not good. I believe him because it was God that was saying it. Whatever God says is final. <laughs> so God looked at the earth with all his positivism, <laughs> with all his hope, with all his faith, with every love that God has. God says, indeed. <laughs> like, I cannot. There's no way of sugarcoating this reality. This is the state of things. The earth is corrupt. So at what point do we also look at things? Maybe we can just digress a little bit. You see the schools that your children are going, and you tell yourself, the schools could be expensive, but guess what? They are corrupt. Corruption is corruption. So what is the opposite of corruption? So if the society is corrupt, society is evil, there is a place in God to make your children good in spite of the corruption that prevails on the earth. So, if the word speaks corruption, don't you think there is an incorruptible word that you can share with your children, that you can share with your wife, that you can share with your husband that weakens the power of corruption? So, if you want to fight corruption, you need the incorruptible to fight the corruptible. You need things that cannot be corrupted to, to cleanse, to clear, to perfect things that are corrupted. So God looked upon the earth, verse 12, Genesis 6, 12, and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh. Can you see corruption is not, a, is not the matter of the spirit-filled people? No, it is the matter of the flesh people. He said, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Their way, another way <laughs> we can explain their way is their culture. Whether you go to this city, the one that was built, the city of Noah, uh, Enoch, that was built by Cain. Or you go to other cities that were existing in those days. God said, every city he went to, he saw corruption. The culture was corrupt. Education system, corrupt. The entertainment, corrupt. <laughs> the games, the place. Don't forget, entertainment didn't start in our time. It had been. There was a time Mo Mo uh, Moses went up to God. And the Bible says when he was with God, the people began to play. That's entertainment. They were excited. They were playing. And what they were doing, they were doing, they were committing idolatry. <laughs> so, entertainment can be corrupt. <laughs> so, when you know corruption has permeated everywhere like that, do you just fold your hands and wish by luck your children will imagine well? No. No, sir. No, ma'am. Children don't accidentally emerge well. Children are product of process. Process of parenting. Quality parenting. Now, when parenting gets missing, children then becomes product of societal. Societal parenting. Oh, God. It's as if parenting is not something that comes from father and mother alone. Parenting is raising children up. Anyone can parent. The schools can parent for you. The schools can raise them. The, the society can raise them. In Nigeria, especially in the northern part of Nigeria, families play little role in the upbringing of children. You see children on the street every time. And so they talk about out of, out of school children in Nigeria, for instance, millions of children out of school. They are out of the school system. Assuming the school has any good to offer them, they are out of that good. So whatever they are in, when you are out of something, you are in something else. Whatever they are in, we also impart them what the school intends to impart, but opposite. Opposite of good. That's evil. So you see them stealing. You see them fighting. I've caught a number of boys fighting on the street. A boy and a girl fighting on the street a number of times. They are carrying plates, carrying food plates on, the, on their hands, running on the street. They even tie rope on plates and put it on their necks, they run. They are begging for food. They go around, they greet you good money in one way or the other. In their language, open you, we give them money. Money they will use to eat. You ask, where are their parents? They are missing. A man and a woman came together for those children to emerge. 
but the men and the women have not maintained that oneness to raise them up. It is a problem to bring children to the world and not be responsible for raising them up. It is something that is so problematic that it attracts the punishment of God. God cannot bless a marriage that brings children to the earth and is not available, is not able to raise them up. The, person will be, the persons will be caused. You know, it happens that it is some men that will just be, they will just be absent. The children are growing up in a part of the country. The, the father is somewhere else. And this father is also committing adultery somewhere else. And the children are left with the mothers to take care of. You think that man can be blessed by God? No. That's why you keep seeing them struggling. They keep struggling. It is not enemy from your village that is fighting you. You are fighting yourself. Go back to your responsibility. The blessing of God does not fall on nothing. It falls on something. God is willing to support you financially. If only you can be there to raise this student. Because when you don't raise them, the enemies of God will raise them. And then we grow up to become problematic to God's purpose. We keep starting up NGOs to solve societal problems. There wouldn't have been societal problems if parents have been alive to their responsibilities from the 60s. In 1960 to date, Nigeria wouldn't be in the state they are in as, as a nation if parents have been responsible for 1960 to date. So we've had fathers and mothers who have been drinking palm wine, sitting under the tree, putting some stick in their mouth and enjoying life. And that time they were not enjoying, but they thought they were enjoying. If only they had raised the children, many of them would have been in real enjoyment now. What was the enjoyment of the 70s and 80s compared to now? And so for few mothers and few fathers that really spend time to raise children, you will find a man and his wife. Maybe they are judges and all their children are also either judges or lawyers. You see a professor who is married to a professor and all the children are all having masters and PhD. And you see pastor's children who have all their children either becoming general overseer of this church, general overseer of that church, they, they produce of their kind. These parents, it's difficult for them to suffer at old age. You abandon your responsibility. You begin to sing to Fela songs. Or you begin to sing to Sonia Ade songs. You begin to sing to Ebenezer Obey songs. You come late. You travel to a different part of the country. You drink. You drink Gouda. You drink beer. You take girls around. And you do all that from the 70s to 80s to 90s to 2000. And then you want to wake up now in your 70 years, 75, and you want to have joy at old age. You won't. The children you didn't take care of then cannot take care of you now. They have become problems to the society and they will end up becoming problems for you. And so I'm speaking to young parents. You see, you think you have money now. Guess what? You don't know what will happen in the future. For many Nigerians living in Nigeria today, we know that Nigeria, living in Nigeria is tougher now than 10 years ago. So parents, I knew parents that could say, I don't need children's money to survive. I can survive on my own. And they were collecting 30,000 naira salary in those days. What is the pension of that 30,000 naira today? I'm fine. I take care of myself. I eat well. Whether the children go to school, they are happy. It doesn't matter. And now today, they cannot take care of themselves with the income of the yesterday, yesterday years. So you think you are also fine now. You are collecting three fifty thousand naira. You are collecting four hundred. You are collecting six hundred thousand salary. Do you know that will be nothing in years to come? In the next ten years, that may be useless. It may never buy you anything. What can? What can 30,000 naira? Some, some, some parents, some of our parents retired on 16,000 naira. Some retired on 12,000 naira. Imagine pension of 100% on that money. Imagine they even increased it to 22,000 naira, 500. What can our mothers in the villages, in the cities, what can they buy with 20,000 naira? Train up your children in the way that they must go. Guess what? Besides the society that will benefit from your training, you will be the first partaker of it. It is impossible to raise your children well and to suffer in your old age. It's impossible. Go and check your Bible. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. There is no parent that, that led, that raised children well in the Bible. 
and then had to suffer at old age. Look at Jacob. Look at the experience he went through. You see, he was, so, he was such a passionate father that even the, young, the brothers that, 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 sent their, that sold their brothers away, they knew it. if their father should need the truth, he could kill all of them. Because the father had passion for the children. <laughs> and the man, when he couldn't find his son, Joseph, he was not happy for the years. When he got to meet him, you will see the love of the father. He was not a man missing in action. And guess what? At old age, he, he enjoyed. He enjoyed. When other people were suffering their time, he was enjoying because he was the father of the prime minister. You can't become the father of a premier, a prime minister, when you don't know. You are not, you are not a good father in your own prime days. You, are, you were not a good mother in your own prime days. Check the people in their sisters today across the world. I don't know about developed countries where you don't have to have children at all to live okay. But in Africa, you don't have good children, you will suffer. How many people who are above 60 in Africa today who are enjoying? If you can find them, do a correct statistics. You will realize that they have good children. <laughs> they have good children. Children that were well raised up. Children that they had time for. Children that they didn't emerge randomly, they were deliberately raised up. And so what is my challenge to parents? The first challenge is, in fact, if, if you are a single brother, a single sister, you are listening, the first challenge is be intentional with your marriage. Know that when your marriage is intentional, you enter it intentionally, you, you live in the marriage intentionally, you will be able to do the next intentional thing, which is being intentional as a parent. Do intentional parenting. Tell yourself, I am doing this to my children and this is where they will be in the future. I am doing this to my boys, to my girls, and this is who they will be in the future. Be a visionary parent. <laughs> you can't have vision of your child becoming the governor of the central bank of your country, and you're the same person who does not care if the child goes to school. He can't get there randomly, accidentally. You need to be that mother that fights for your children. Fight for them, defend them, provide for them, take them to school. Your husband is no more alive. You are the only person. Be responsible, mother. Don't give up. Your joy is ahead. You see, God will reward you for raising them and the children will also reward you for raising them. I've not found any responsible, any responsible child well taken care of when he or she was young and the person is not under any spell that does not take care of those who took care of him or her. So take care of your children. Teach them, protect them, cover them, pray for them, fast for them, <laughs> intercede for them. When they do wrong, punish them, train them, discipline them. <laughs> Let them be wise up. Your investment over your children is not a waste. Even when the child is three years, invest in the child. The child is seven years, invest. The child is 17, invest. Invest until your joy is full. Somebody could say, how long should I do the investment until your joy is full? A time is coming. It becomes shameful for you to do anything for that child, financially or otherwise. The child will tell you, mommy, don't worry. Daddy, don't worry. I'm fine. I'm fine. I, you know I'm always fine. You know, they are always fine, meaning that now, now that you have done your job, I am now always fine. They were not always there was a time if you didn't do anything, nothing happened in their lives. But they've come to a point. They've grown. They've matured. They cannot stand for themselves. Parents, I know you are now currently. I know parents now, now, that are listening to me. People that are in their 30s, in their 40s and 50s. You are now standing. But do you know there are some of our colleagues who can also stand? There are parents today who are also financial bodies, emotional bodies on their own parents. So you don't want to replicate your lifestyle in your children. You don't want them to grow. At 40, you are still sending pocket money to your 40-year-old child. You are calling the person a child when the person is already a father of another child, of other children. You don't want to continue at 50. You are still paying the house rent of your children. You see people that labor at old age, you wonder, is it for them to eat? Some of them are still laboring for their children and grandchildren. It shouldn't be so. They say, work now so that you can play later. 
When you play now, you work later. The same thing goes for marriage. So God does not love a corrupt society. God loves the world, but he doesn't love it when it's corrupt. And so God so ate the corruption of the world, even after this time, that instead of destroying the whole world, <laughs> because some believers could have been comfortable in quotes to have a world where the only people left are the people that are godly. But still, God doesn't want to do the same thing he did in the days of Noah anymore. Instead of destroying the old world, he reserved it to the time of judgment of the old world. But what does he do? He decided, he wanted to give everyone chance in every generation. No God. Then he brought Jesus for God so loved the world. John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him will not die, will not perish with the perishing generation. But have everlasting life that begins on the earth and continues to eternity in Jesus. The same way God wanted to destroy the whole world, those who were sinning. Now, God now wants to save the whole world. And he did it and he's doing it in Jesus. So God doesn't want a corrupt world. And the hope of God is still children. And so I wrote something that the, the story of Jesus corroborates. When wrong men marry wrong women, what we have as a people is we have wrong children. No, some people never believe they are wrong children. If you read this Bible, you will soon see that children were born to the sons of God that married. They married. I didn't have time to dwell on it. God was not the one that connected those marriages. You know, they normally say whatever the Lord joins together, let no man put us so that God didn't join them. The Bible says they saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and then they took wives for themselves. They took. God didn't give them. Adam was given wife by God. They took, and Bible says, of all whom, any woman they chose for themselves, they took. And so when the daughters of men were one with the sons of God, meaning that it is also possible in reality to have spiritual brothers, men of, who claim to be men of the spirit, who also get married to women of the flesh. And the only thing that makes you to marry that woman is her beauty. Forgetting that beautiful women of the flesh, we always do the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh are evident. You don't like it too. So the Bible says children were born to them. They were mighty men. So we thought they were good men. No, the Bible says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the head. Those mighty men, they became wicked. They were ruthless. They were destroying. They were maiming. They were causing crisis everywhere. That's it. Wrong marriages, failed marriages we always produce failed and wrong children. Children who look like dried fishes that cannot be bent again. Who goes about corrupting everything they touch. And what happens when there are wrong children, what we then have is social problems. Social problems. <laughs> I'm sure we know there are so societal issues. Societal problems, they are always caused by wrong, wrong children who are also from wrong marriages. And wrong marriages are product of wrong men. What's the opposite of wrong? Right. So when a right man marries a right woman, we have right children. Another way you can put the right is godly children. And then you have so societal development or social development. The, the society is developed. The society is developed. So one of the things I want to conclude with is the problems of societies don't fall down from the sky. The problems of societies come from the children that are born on the head. Wrong children. They are the cause of the problems of societies. Guess what? Only the children that are born to the head have the capacity to solve the problems of the head. So, oh Lord. I see a situation where the devil is committed to making sure that wrong children are born. So the devil makes sure that there are wrong men, always, wrong women, always, who produce wrong children. And the devil knows that the reason for this is to create a wrong society, evil society. And God is also in a business. The Bible says, and it is because of that business that God says, I hate divorce. Divorce will always lead to social problems. 
The Bible even says it in Malachi chapter 2 from verse 14 to 15. It says, because it covers your clothes, your appearance with violence, your garment with violence. Divorce produces violence. Did you see it? Violence was everywhere on the earth. Sons of men, it's as if sons of men and the sons of God and the daughters of men could never become one genuinely. They will always divorce. <laughs> I see them divorcing, splitting. Some children will go to their father, sons of God, demons, <laughs> demonic beings. And some will stay with their mothers who have now become demonic. <laughs> so wherever they go, they learn bad things. They learn corruption. They are with their daddy. They are learning bad. Some boys are learning how to smoke with their fathers. They are learning how to do master to masturbate. They are learning all manner of things from their fathers. When they come to their mothers, they learn other things too. Maybe how to lie, how to cheat, how to steal. They learn other things. All right. God will help us. Guess what? As the devil is committed to creating havoc in societies with children, God is equally much, much committed, much more committed to solving social problems with children. So every time a child is born into a Christian home, into a believing home, a godly home, shout hallelujah because glory indeed belongs to our God. It is a blessing. It is a deliverance. <laughs> When Jesus was sent to the earth, he didn't come as a full-grown man. He came as a child that was born. For to us, the child is born. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And unto us, the son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. It's not exclusive to Jesus. Guess what? Responsibilities of the kingdom will rest on the shoulders of your children. So be deliberate in making them kingdom ambassadors. Raise them well as ambassadors of God. Don't worry. Even though they look small and insignificant now, in the days and years to come, they will emerge authorities. They will emerge rulers. They will emerge queen. They will emerge kings. They will emerge as servants of the Lord. Men that fight. Men that could stand on their feet and fight. Men that could defend the rights of, and of people of the poor and fight for justice in their societies. So, we can only do so much in our own generation. The big job lies ahead of the next generation. The things many of us are confronted now with, our parents didn't face them. So, guess what? There are things our children will face. Let them be ready for it. Prepare them spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, financially, in every lead that is available. Prepare them. The Bible says in every labor, there is profit. Every labor of investment of your children will produce profit. They will emerge well. They will emerge well. And I speak wellness into our parenting, into our children. In the name of Jesus, we shall be well parents that raise well children. And we shall have a well society. And I declare concerning our generation and the generations to come, it shall be well. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father, for the gift of this moment. Thank you for the word that he has sent to us. Lord, we ask for grace to be established in this truth, to fight the good fight of faith, and to emerge victorious. Parents, victorious husbands, victorious fathers and mothers of victorious children who take over territories on God's behalf. In the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name, O God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you for the gift of your time. I believe you have been blessed. Please share the news around. Share this video around. Like it. Comment in the comment section. Let's know how God has imparted your heart with the words that he has shared with us. I hope to see us in day eight. And I'm sure it will even be greater than the seventh day. See you tomorrow and God bless you.